Welcome to the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Podcast. I'm Kate Moore Youssef, your host, and if you've arrived here, there must be a reason. I'm guessing you're curious to learn more about improving your wellbeing alongside ADHD, or maybe looking for some advice or guidance to feel healthier and calmer. So, why start this podcast? I'm a wellbeing and lifestyle coach. EFT practitioner, mum to four kids, and I discovered my own ADHD alongside one of my daughters at the age of 40. And now, after supporting many other women just like me, and probably you, I feel there's a need for more emphasis on well-being and lifestyle help for women with ADHD. And through the podcast, I want to offer you new insights and perspectives to enable you to live your most fulfilled, calm and balanced life. So wherever you are on your ADHD journey, my aim is to support you in finding the awareness and the most aligned tools to enhance your well-being so you can make the most intentional mindset and lifestyle choices moving forwards. Ready to get started? Here's the episode. Hi everyone, welcome back to the ADHD Women's Wellbeing Podcast and today's guest, we've been waiting a while for this, I'm really excited, we've got Grace Timothy. Now you may recognise Grace's name, Um, she's a writer and she is also a podcast host and her podcast, Is It My ADHD?, sort of started similar time to this and I listened so happy to listen to another podcast I related to so much. So while I was recording this, also been listening to Grace's podcast and I know that we've got sort of quite a shared audience and so it's just fantastic to have Grace here so we can really delve into all things ADHD and I guess what led us both to starting our podcast so Grace welcome I'm so happy to have you thank you so much for having me I also love listening to your podcast and and it's just quite insane that we both came about around the same time with I think quite similar experiences um so it's been amazing to watch you soar it's been (laughs) awesome well, likewise. And you know, what's always intrigued me, I always thought, right, whenever I speak to Grace and we do this interview, I've got the first question I'm going to ask you is, in your intro, you said it was a chance meeting with an audiologist, which already intrigued, why, you know, an audiologist, <laughs> how they picked up on the ADHD, because that's quite a convoluted way to getting a diagnosis. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened in that sort of that session with the audiologist? Yeah, so, well, it's still like a bit of a mystery to me, but basically I've always had like a slight problem with my hearing. As a child, I had a lot of ear infections. So it was kind of just assumed that it was one of those things that had happened as a result of damage, really. But it got worse maybe in the last five or so years and got to the point where my husband was like, you need to go see someone now. And he never says that about anything. He's like the most stoic. So I was like, shit, it's a tumour. I'm going to (laughs) go. So I went along and initially, there was you know a lot of leg jiggling I'd been waiting for a hell of a long time in the waiting room and I think my lips were quite pursed and although I would never be rude to anyone I know that my face just betrays either anxiety or or impatience and then (laughs) as he was kind of writing notes and being quite quiet I was sort of filling the silences with like inane chat like I always do and at one point I said uh, I just don't even know if I have got a hearing problem I think probably I've just got like um, selective hearing and when I'm anxious I think I drown things out And he was like, he just looked up and was like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, if I'm anxious, if I'm like in a party or anything, like I quite often go a bit deaf and I think that's just my way of shutting down to shut things out. And then I just thought, oh Christ, I can see in his face I've gone like the wrong way. I shouldn't have said anything. Um, And then he just kind of like looked at me for a long, long, long time and then was like, have you ever been assessed for any kind of neurodivergence? And I was like, no, all I knew was autism. That's literally my frame of reference. I had friends with kids who were autistic, but other than that, you know, no experience personally, really. And he explained that he had ADHD. And he said, I'm just sort of looking at the way that you're sat and the way that you're talking and some of the things that you're talking about in terms of anxiety and shutting down and not hearing is, you know, classic ADHD. But if he hadn't had that ADHD himself, there's no way that he would have gone like, Oh, because I've masked for years. So yeah, I would ultimately like to run around his office, shout at him for being late. Like, do you know what I mean? I'd like to do all that stuff, but I would never betray that inner feeling. I would always keep it locked down. So um, I think it was just, yeah, he was incredibly intuitive and sensitive to that. Um, Yeah, and it was just, that was it. And I actually walked away from that appointment being like, that was weird. And maybe his ADHD is somehow like clouding his judgment because I clearly don't have it. So um, yeah, it was it was a long a long process even after that. But I think as you'll know, as soon as someone says something like that to you, even if you're dismissing it at first, you then ruminate and ruminate, don't you? And then you know 
you have to do your research and stuff. So yeah, that was the first moment really. Wow. Who's kind of like your ADHD angel, just kind of giving you that little, that nudge. I always yeah. think, I mean, I've done that to quite a few people, um, maybe unsolicited, you know, told them that they might have ADHD when they've not even asked. Um, but I think once you've been had that diagnosis and you've stopped doing that, you know, the delving, we can spot them. You know, I always mm. talk about this radar system yes. that we all seem to have. Um, and you can sort of just see it, you know, I can see it in kids, I can see it in women, I can see it in my friend's husbands. And um, some people are interested and some people are just like, you know, they shut that down. They're not, you know, and then you kind of have to read the room, which is quite hard for us anyway. So. Yeah, that's so true. But the fact that you try to read the room, I think is a step forward, right? Like I definitely have gone through phases in my life where I would have just bloody said whatever it was. But actually, I think as you grow, if you're around the right people, you just learn, don't you, to kind of remember those things and that not everybody wants to hear it. So yeah, yeah. And, and do you know what's interesting, what you said about sort of selective hearing? I, my kids go mad at me about this because I'll if I'm on my phone trying to write an email or an Instagram post, which takes a huge amount of concentration, they could say, you know, can I have Rice Krispies for dinner every night? And I'll just go, yes. And, and I, you know, I just, and they, they, it drives them mad. And I remember my mum doing that. You know, I go, mum, mum, mum. And then like, I go, Ruth. And the and then she goes, yes. <laughs> And she'd jump out of her skin and it's like, oh my God, I'm doing exactly the same thing. Mm. That that selective hearing, we just, maybe like you say, I wonder if it's a learned thing or it's part of the neurodivergence that we go, we have to con- try so hard to concentrate that everything else is blocked out. Yeah, and I think that hyper-focus thing as well of just like not being able to let anything else in because you're so singularly focused on that one thing. Um, but yeah, I'm exactly, I'm guilty of the same thing as well. And I've had to really explain like, especially to my daughter, like I'm not deaf, but like, I might as well be, you're going to need to communicate with me in the same way. Sometimes you need to physically like touch me to break that moment. Um, and at the moment, I think she thinks it's hilarious, but I can see in time that's going to become very frustrating. So I'm, I'm working on it. But I mean, a lot of it, I don't know if you feel this, but I, I try and work on things, but a lot of it is just like part of my biology. And it's really difficult to rail against it because it's just like an instinct, isn't it? It's really odd. Yeah. So tell me, I'm intrigued. So you got your diagnosis in 2021. Yeah. When did you get that epiphany, right, I'm going to do a podcast? Like what what led you to thinking, because I'm sure we've sort of had a similar thing, is, is curiosity or, you know, you tell me what led you to wanting to do that? Well, really, because I'm a writer, my first instinct was to do a book. <laughs> and, um, and I've got a, a literary agent. So I went to her and was like, I, you know, I just, I can't believe this is happening in the world. The, the main thing that was really biting me was this the racial gap and the gender gap of diagnosis and I just like I I couldn't believe how little research there was um into it and and all the papers were quite damning of like a life lived with ADHD and all that kind of thing and I was just like but what like I can't find any research about what it really feels like I want to hear like anecdotes and stuff from people because that's how we form our connections right we share that information with people and feel less alone so I said to her like I want to write this book and I worked really really hard on a proposal and interviewed like Dr. Tony Lloyd of the ADHD Foundation and various psychiatrists and various uh, researchers for this book. And essentially, no one wanted to publish it. (laughs) It's the story there. So I had all this information and I'd done all this research and I felt so in it that I just thought actually like, is a book the best you know, platform for someone with ADHD to find that connection. Maybe not. I I know I struggle sometimes with reading. Um, And so I was just kind of reaching around to see, like, would it be a blog? Would it be just Instagram or whatever? And then obviously realise that I spend so much time listening to podcasts. Like, it's such an easy, manageable, bite-sized shot of information that you can kind of go away from and come back to that I thought that that was probably the way to do it. So really it started, yeah, as a book and then all the information needed to go onto a different platform. And then, yeah, I I approached an agency because, again, I knew I couldn't make it. I would never make it. I would just have the idea and started to approach women and non-binary people to to be guests and to chat about it. And it's down to them, really. Like, I just sort of turn up and ask a few questions, um, as you'll know. But, like, I think it's the agency putting that together into, like, some sort of professional shape. And then these amazing people that are happy to share their stories, which always blows my mind because some of it's really, really emotional labour intensive. Mm. So that's, yeah, that's how it came about, really. And it's just been the best therapy and coaching and all those things I could have ever, 
dreamt of really it's been amazing yeah no it's a it's absolutely brilliant every episode's been fantastic and what's interesting is when you were speaking then my coaching hat went on and I was like you know your the ADHD sort of imposter syndrome type thing is like I can see because you're saying it's not me it's them and it's the agency and no 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 but actually it's not because the way you bring in your reflections and your insights, you know, and, and how your ADHD looks is just as pertinent as your interviewees as well. And I think that's what makes it so, you know, listenable and it's just, it's brilliant. I'm also an auditory learner and I've only re- sort of really realised that I'm a bookworm as well. I absolutely love reading, but the information doesn't retain. Mm, yeah. So I can read books and books and books and I'll probably just remember one snapshot from one chapter. <laughs> And I would never, you know how certain people can just reel off like quotes from people. And I always wonder, like they're speaking, they're doing this keynote speak and they like do a quote from Einstein. I'm like, I wish I could do that because I'd never be able to remember any of that. But with podcasts and listen to audio books, it just seems to stay in. It just, I just retain the information. So I think I was similar to you in that respect that I just thought I'm just going to listen to podcasts because that's how I learn and that's how the information retains. I wonder if that is an ADHD trait, I think, to to be able to retain information more on on that side than reading. Yeah, I think there's a lot around the way that you receive instructions, isn't it? So I've I've kind of like dipped into a little bit to like working with ADHD in the, you know, in the workplace or learning with ADHD and stuff. And there does seem to be a lot of like either you need your instructions written down after you've heard them. So some people learn that way. And then the opposite way, you know, is also true that once you've kind of read something, you then need it to be sort of reinstated verbally. Um, so I think it just depends on how you learn and what your ADHD sort of status is. Because also like hyperactive versus inattentive versus, you know, the impulsive. There's so many different kind of varieties, isn't there? But no, I'm with you. Mm-hmm. I, I definitely benefit from hearing things out loud for sure. Although weirdly, when I'm watching TV, I really need subtitles. Okay. I don't know what that says, but like that's a focus thing, I think. It's just dra- to drag yeah. me properly in. Hmm. Yeah, I think so. You know, talking about how ADHD shows up, how does yours show up? And how did it show up before you were diagnosed? And how, what do you notice now after your your diagnosis? Mm. Well, I think like when I was a kid, it was showing up in like the whole not being able to sit still or, or rather not being comfortable or happy after long periods of sitting still um hyper focus but to the point of sort of illness almost like I would be happy at nine years old staying up until 2 a.m doing homework which obviously is not I mean obviously secretly my parents would not have allowed that in a million years but I just you know would always find ways um definitely the insomnia definitely um getting into like silly kind of trouble where I just hadn't listened and paid attention but would never have done anything intentionally or maliciously or anything like that so it was just kind of I would quite often make mistakes and like I say, not listen and, you know, drop things and be clumsy and all those things, but then would internalise those feelings of shame and not let go of something that had happened like other children would. It escalated quite quickly when I was eight and I changed schools and it was a very old fashioned kind of academic environment. And weirdly, academically, I did really well because I worked really hard. And at that age, most of it is just recall, isn't it? So you can kind of learn things and recall. There's no analysis involved. So I could I could just sort of parrot fashion learn things. But at home, I was constantly nauseous. I was crying myself to sleep every night. I didn't want to go to school ever. I didn't want to socialise. I had like extreme health anxiety, OCD, you know, disordered eating. It was all there, but like there was no one to piece those things together and be like, this is obviously like an underlying condition. Um, and, you know, even now, I think if I'd had that in... 2022 I still think it's very difficult for people to kind of put those together um and then I think honestly like I just learned to mask there have been certain times where the demands have stacked up so I had a really hardcore job in my early 20s and that really kind of was the undoing and unraveling of me for a while um but I was also very responsive to those feelings of threat so I eventually worked out how to go freelance which was a game changer for me so much happier um when I had my daughter we moved quite close to my family and that changed our whole kind of living environment for the better I've sort of without knowing what was going on I knew that I needed a lot of time on my own I knew that I was probably half extrovert half introvert that needed a lot of recalibrating time I have a really really exceptionally patient partner who sort of has seen me through a lot of those moments and I think it's only now that I'm looking back and thinking it was those demands that were placed on me and I've luckily managed to edit life so that the demands aren't as kind of 
all consuming now. So, you know, I mean, also I'm older. I get like my where I am in my career is that I understand how things work. and I'm not constantly fueled by fear of fucking it all up kind of thing. So I think I'm surviving better in that respect. But I'm also very aware of how things change hormonally. So if I'm heading, I'm probably heading towards perimenopause fairly soon. And I'm aware that that can reshift things. I think, you know, when my daughter leaves home, that will be a big shift. I think, you know, when I sometimes look at taking, taking on certain jobs and roles, I, I completely rethink it with this new awareness. So at the moment, I feel like I'm walking a fine line between being too cautious with the ADHD in the back of my mind and trying to kind of forge forward and be brave and do things that I probably wouldn't have done before. So it's a funny old time, really. But I'm also incredibly lucky that it went this direction that I was supported by so many different structures around me, like my family even like work schools all of those things were very supportive and I think being a white you know middle class I suppose person from a certain amount of privilege meant that I was sort of protected from a lot of the outcomes that I think other people with ADHD have experienced so yeah happy days that I've got to this point and I, I still feel all right um and I think the anxiety and all those other sort of comorbidities that I've had in the past I've reached a point where those aren't an issue at the moment but I'm very aware that they could be in the future so I think yeah it's just all about awareness really and being careful yeah listen I resonate so much with so much of what you said then and I had like huge amount of guilt for having those privileges you know that's only just accepted and beforehand I was just so I felt so guilty for having the privilege of having a supportive husband being able to pay for a private diagnosis like so many things that have led to an easier way of life for me that was on my mind all the time as well just you know having the guilt and I think as we get older you're right we do start knowing what's good for us and what's not good for us but sometimes we can be a little bit too cautious I was talking about this with some clients the other day and it was about this like limited potential that we put that on ourselves like we know we've got all this potential but then sometimes our limitations feel so strong that they override our potential so we kind of know that we're very easily overwhelmed, that, you know, we um, can burn out really quickly, we get exhausted, that we always need to decompress. And that aggravates us more because we want to achieve things, we want to be productive, and we ha- we're, all, we're ambitious with, you know, our careers, and we want to keep going. And then we're always like, it feels like we're always sort of hitting a bit of a, you know, a wall, because we maybe preempt our well our wellness now we kind of know what's what's ahead we've been there we've done the burnout a few times so sometimes it can feel just exhausting in that place just being in that cycle of like well if I take that job and I do that thing is that going to exhaust me is that going to overwhelm me and sometimes we have to make that leap and do the thing that's going to light us up and fulfill us and do all the things that we want to do but maybe with just a slightly different awareness of yeah, we can do the thing we want to do. But, you know, instead of working full time in an office, can I do like one day at home, two days at home? Can I make sure that I'm not working the whole day and I do like, a? I don't know, you know, there's so many different things. And I think when we just reframe and we get a different perspective, that it's okay to want to do all the things, but also recognise that our energy is hugely important. And, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of your career that that was kind of like the unravelling So I think it's lots of different, lots of tinkering Mm. and rebalancing all the time, different periods of our life, like you say, hormonally, different periods when our kids are different ages, our career, you know, we're having busy times, less busy time and not giving ourselves um, a hard time Mm. for it, not sort of judging ourselves for the choices that we're making that feel right at the time. Well, I was going to say, like, I think that also that that awareness, it's not always accurate, is it? So like, I've definitely in my life had moments where I've been super productive where you would expect things to be too challenging so like when I when I wrote my first book I I think my daughter was about three when I wrote my book I think she was so still very much like there was no ebb and flow of need it was like constant with her but I wrote a book and I wrote articles and I was kind of doing press interviews and all that kind of stuff all at the same time and I obviously I didn't know I had ADHD so I wasn't waiting for that burnout but equally it never came Whereas I think there have been other times in my life where the demands have been less and I haven't been able to cope and the burnout has happened much sooner. So you can't always anticipate either. I think you're right. I think you have to be agile and just constantly aware. Um, And also know that there's always 
a way out of things. Actually, that's a hugely privileged thing to say because everyone has to work and, and I get that. So I've been really lucky that I've often been able to quit a job knowing either that there's another job or that I can freelance and that there's always a way for me to earn money kind of thing. And I know that's not the case for everyone, but I feel like if you, even if that get out clause is that you don't socialize for the next month and you just, you get through work and you go to bed at six and, you know, there's always a way hopefully to kind of accommodate yourself and try to avoid that burnout. But I mean, it, yeah, I just don't think you can always anticipate when it's coming. And that's the shock, isn't it? I think. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I've had that recently where the burnout came in the form of a back spasm and it was three days, literally just completely couldn't move and everything had to stop and I could feel it building and building and building but I kept ignoring it and then it happened and it was kind of like well I told you yeah <laughs> you know you weren't listening so I'm going to do something quite dramatic here so you will listen and that's happened to me a couple of times and, and it unfortunately happens with my back that I just feel it and I just keep ignoring it because I'm pushing through and pushing through but I feel that this time was so I had the back spasm and then um, I tried to walk around the garden because in my head I was like, well, I just need to keep walking and moving and it's just going to go and then I can carry on. And then I got stung by a bee on my foot and it was on my foot so I couldn't even walk. Oh, no. So then I spent a week literally with my foot raised um, and that was a bit kind of like a big universal shout at me saying, you need to slow down, which I did. And when I slowed down, things fell into place so I'm hoping, I'm actually saying this on the podcast, so this is kind of like me reminding myself that I can't go back to that place because it's not sustainable. Mm. And I, sometimes I think with ADHD, we forget, what well, we do forget. And we go, oh, it's fine. You know, this time's going to be different. Mm. And then it, the burnout just comes out in a different way, it just shows up differently. You know, whether it's illness or a mental health problem or a relationship meltdown you know it always shows up so true and I think like also there's the sense of that hyper focus can be quite alluring and it can kind of seduce you into thinking that this time you've got it and like if you feel that energy and that flow of stuff happening really brilliantly it feels like it would be crazy to to cut that off and and sort of say no to it so god there's just so many isn't there there's so many things that you have to be aware of and to try and manage but I think I think you're bang on and I think this is this should be the main takeaway is that you have to you have to see and you have to take that leap like that's exactly it so as this podcast has grown I've wanted to create a space for more like-minded women um, to join and be able to access more of my resources and workshops and that is why I've created the ADHD women's well-being collective i am absolutely delighted to have this membership there's so many of you on board already we are having fantastic conversations and what i'm promising you in this membership is that we are going to have at least one monthly live workshop i'm bringing in lots of different guest experts extra resources I'm not being able to provide on the podcast, conversations that, again, that I haven't got time to provide on the podcast, bringing you all my best resources, previous workshops, and just allowing things to flow when I'm finding interesting pieces of information. I'm sharing them on the platform. So if you are interested in being part of a group of like-minded people who wants to learn more about their ADHD, learn more how to help yourself, empower yourself with new holistic emotional and well-being practices, then I would absolutely love it if you came and joined us in the collective. If you're interested, you can come and have a little nosy, come and see what it's all about. I've got information on the show notes of this podcast. If you head to my website, which is coachingbykate.me.uk, or if you go to Patreon and you search up ADHD Women's Wellbeing Collective, you will find all the information there. I've kept it as um, affordable as possible. So it's much more affordable than one-to-one -one coaching. And for that, you get to have access to me. I am answering your questions live. I'm able to give you advice and insights and hopefully share some of the tips that I'm getting from working with so many of you. So if you just head to my show notes of the podcast, you will see all the details and I really hope to see you there. So tell me, I mean, we've talked about some of the, the more negative side of, of ADHD and I never want to diminish the challenges because when people turn around and say, oh, it's a superpower, it's a superpower, I'm kind of like, no, because you don't really understand the nuances and all the, you know, 
the comorbidities that that go with it and some of them are so debilitating um you know you mentioned before about you know health anxiety before we get onto the positive stuff i just wanted to touch on that actually because that is something that i have and i see one of my daughters unfortunately you know it's come out of nowhere it's not something that i you know i, I try really hard not to my husband's very against you know obsessing over anything health wise and it's and it's coming out for and I can see that. Um, and that's something that not many people make that connection. And, and I've heard it a few times now with different people, you know, talking about health anxiety with ADHD. Is that something that's been with you for since you were a child? Yeah, it's the one thing I think the, the one constant that continued really far into my adulthood. I think everything else I sort of was able to address in some way or I kind of grew out of it in inverted commas um but the health anxiety was yeah a steady constant it kind of ebbed and flowed so I remember through university and through sort of sixth form thinking oh I'm over it now actually because I can be around people who are ill I can look after people I can be ill myself and it doesn't seem to be as impactful but as soon as I had my daughter and I think firstly the weight of that responsibility of keeping someone else healthy and alive but also being in all of those spaces where I felt very triggered so schools and nurseries and all that kind of thing yeah 100% um, and she actually had a health scare kind of episode when she was two that really took away all of the sort of comfort that you seek when you when you're worried about health so you know I have my husband will be like that's fine don't worry about that that's okay that's okay and unfortunately we got really bad news for her that was or a really scary diagnosis that was suddenly like see there there are no there's nothing I can rely on there's no like anything could happen and it could all go wrong and actually all of your sort of platitudes now mean absolutely nothing there's no I can't seek any comfort from anywhere um so I took a bit of a dive after that but um but I mean I did CBT and and he I remember he was kind of like again pre-ADHD diagnosis you don't really qualify for like phobia therapy or any of those things this is kind of a generalized anxiety that you have sort of fixed to health issues so you should see a psychologist so I saw a psychologist who sort of you know there was lots of stuff about my upbringing as an only child and all that kind of thing and it was like all of these people were kind of almost there and almost touching on how I could get better but actually couldn't see that underneath it was this hyper arousal that comes with ADHD that obviously feeds into anxiety and it was so it was half anxiety and half just this constant state of like I want to say arousal. That sounds like completely the wrong word because that's too fun. Is it hypervigilance? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and just the fact that your nervous system is like, you know, thrown for a loop. So I think that the comorbidity side is really interesting to me because, again, like health anxiety, something's ebbed and flowed. At the moment, I seem to be doing pretty well-ish, bearing in mind we've just come out of a pandemic really odd but I think maybe because everyone else was anxious I was like oh we would predicted it exactly it was fine. there was already something we'd worried about <laughs> exactly. and actually we'd gone very there. happy in a mask <laughs> love a mask don't mind washing my hands at all it was almost like everyone caught up and it became like yes. normal practice what I would love everyone to be totally. doing um yeah so I think it's funny, I think it yeah. is better weirdly from that maybe it's a bit of an immersion therapy as well maybe it's you know the constant threat I suppose um but I, yeah. But also, I think that we're really good in emergency yes. situations, in extreme emergency. So a pandemic, it's like bring mm. it on. I was as cool as a cucumber at the beginning, Same. and my and my husband, who's like always calms me down about you know getting on a flight and what happens. If, I've got a health anxiety with like sick, a sick phobia. Yeah. Oh my yeah. god, yeah. So it's horrific. And so my husband just, you know, but then when it comes to a pandemic and he thought his business was going to crumble yeah. and we were going to have no money and all these horrific things, I was like, everything's going to be fine. So don't worry, I've got this. And it makes no sense apart from the fact that I wonder if it's just because we're so hypervigilant all the time that we run on this nervous energy and anxiety that when it actually does happen, when everyone's been telling us, don't worry, don't worry, and that it does, it's like, you see, mm. this is what we've been prepping for we're like soldiers waiting well it's true it's true I think like and when so for example my daughter has been unwell I can deal with it absolutely fine because it's happened and it's not that anticipation or the need to control the situation I think that's the thing isn't it we've had such a lack of control in our lives through ADHD that we want to grasp it back and I think that explains for me that was 100% behind disordered eating as a teenager you know OCD is a massive thing about controlling your environment and stuff so it is interesting. And then to be cool, yeah, when it when it actually happens to be cool, cool as a cucumber. I think, like, I wonder, yeah, the, what the correlation is between, like, a metaphobia, obviously the phobia of, of being sick. Because when I've seen people about specifically a metaphobia, they've been like, it's not really what you have. It's 
you're not literally frightened of the thing itself. It's more like the control around that and protecting yourself yes. and your family and all that. 100%. Um, but I mean, yeah, I still, I've got so much to figure out and unpick. Honestly, it's ridiculous. But I wonder also, do you think that we, ironically, I've obviously talked about being partially deaf, but I feel like I hear things that other people can't hear in the room. So not as in making things up or having voices in my head, but I can hear that couple over there saying, oh, we'll just give him some more cow pole and he'll be fine. And I'm like, and I'm having a conversation with someone and they're completely oblivious. I'd yes. like, how and why? Because you're tuning in, you're tuning into the fear. And that, you know, if you're the same as me, as if I hear someone coughing in the background, straight away my husband clocks me because he knows what's going on now. He's like, chill, don't worry. But I'd be having a conversation and someone says, oh, I don't feel very well. And straight away, I'm like, my God, step away, move. Yes. <laughs> And I turn into like the biggest baby because, you know, I should be an adult in that situation and I'm not. You know, there's certain kids I won't put in my car because I know they get car sick. So I'm constantly thinking 10 steps ahead. And that's just exhausting in itself, mm, isn't it? it really just is. constantly. We had a voice note conversation a few months ago about camping, didn't we? <laughs> God, yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> And we were we were talking about I won't go into too much detail, but we were sort of saying about all the, the I think it's maybe the anticipation of the this and the, the toilets and all the things that we were worrying about that just ruins all the fun. And I'm trying to get better at that. I'm really trying because I sometimes am like the fun zapper in the family because I'm so anxious about things. And my husband's much more in the moment and doesn't care so much like things like that don't doesn't bother him whereas I'm like well there's not gonna be a toilet what happens if it's this and what happens if I need the toilet in the middle of the night and And I'm just like it's so boring first of all but also it's so tiring to always be so worried about things and I think very much it's about the awareness and of kind of stopping yourself in that moment and thinking like I'm reframing but sometimes it just it's just it is what it is and we just have to accept yeah that's true that's who we are yeah and I think find out whatever can provide any kind of support and comfort I, I've learned that like actually googling you know incubation periods for stomach bugs and things like that doesn't help me and I know now and I know to separate fact from feeling and all those I know it all I think with the ADHD and this is about all anxiety not specific to health anxiety but I think what that does is that you can work as hard as you like and you can take all the meds and you can do all the things that people do to to address anxiety. And actually, if ADHD is beneath all of that, there's only so much you can do. You've got to address the ADHD first, do you know what I mean? And have that awareness or meds or whatever it is that helps you kind of manage that. So that's what I'm learning. And I think it's definitely helped me reframe my anxiety. And as I say, it's not having such a hold nowadays, but I can feel it creeping back in. As the world is coming back to normal and we're challenged with more experiences outside of the house essentially you know I'm there that upsets me a lot because I think I'm the same as you I'm desperately trying to not have that as part of my life and my child's life and all that stuff um but yeah it's a ch- it's such a challenge and it's an ongoing thing and I you know I suspect it always will be yeah sometimes when we're undiagnosed and we're just walking through life with this sort of anxiety and we don't know where it comes from and we don't know we don't have the answers but I think to get that diagnosed, a lot of people come to me and say, well, I've not been diagnosed yet and then I'm suffering from this and all my comorbidities show up as that. And I say, I think just to have that validation of a diagnosis of someone saying, this is how your brain operates. This is why you are who you are. And, you know, there's not anything wrong with you. It's just that your brain just works in slightly different ways. And this is the reason for all the different things that have happened in your life. Just to have that validation, I think can be very comforting. And then reading and joining and having communities and like podcasts and listening to conversations of women that you can relate to who are like minded. I think I take a huge amount of comfort in that. You know, just this conversation alone, where we're both talking about our fear of sick and it's kind of like, okay, I'm not the freak on my own that's scared of that. Where I actually have spoken to a few other women that have got a similar phobia of this. And it for some people it's so, so debilitating. And so I think it's just having, you know, being able to have a conversation with other people who are mums or not mums or working not working and you can relate to different parts of each other's lives and find a bit of humor I always I'm a huge believer that we have to laugh at certain things you know because life can feel so serious that if we don't find little pockets of humor in some of the stuff then the joy is completely sapped yeah, out so true. Um, 
So where do you see some of the good stuff of ADHD in your life? And what have you seen historically, you know, when you didn't know it was ADHD that showed up for you? I think as a journalist or a writer or whatever, that the kind of openness and the honesty has served me so well. I don't have a filter and I'm not upset about that in any way. Like I'm absolutely fine of saying the slightly awkward thing, you know, hopefully busting taboos along the way. I've, you know, so many people have said to me, after I've written an article or my book or whatever, like, God, you really, like, you don't mind oversharing, do you? And I'm like, I just think that that's a funny phrase because there is something that society has, like, constructed that tells you that that was an over or an extra rather than just a sharing. And I, I'm really okay with that. I know some people find it very discomforting and I, like, that's a shame. But, like, for the people that it benefits in some way, I'm good with that. And that has felt like it's put some value or worth to just churning words out a lot of the time um so I love that and I love that you can form connections really quickly with people I think that's lovely I think creatively it's probably helped me think outside the box in a lot of situations on the other hand like that also comes with sometimes I can't think outside the box because I'm like quite like blinkered and like this is black and white and this is the only way it can be so that's an interesting I think dichotomy about um ADHD and being being fun when I'm fun obviously like we've just discussed there's lots of times where we're not fun and we do sap the fun and we could be a fun sponge and all those things but I know that I can sort of get sort of silly quite quickly with my kid and she really appreciates that and I think I do think that is to do with ADHD but I think essentially it's that lack of filter that helps with with all of those kind of creative outlets Obviously, it can also result in offending people and upsetting people. And I've had a lot of friendships implode. And that's one of my sort of worst parts of the whole thing. The whole experience is I look back on friendships and think, I totally get what happened now. And that's such a shame. I wish I could have managed that differently because I've, you know, upset other people and just lost people as well. A bit out of sight, out of mind as well. That's a really big problem here. But yeah, I try to I try to think of the things that it's given me. I think hyper-focus, working quickly, um, having like a a sort of very strong work ethic that then sort of follows through you know work can take over everything for me I could work from eight in the morning until midnight and carry on through to the next morning at eight kind of thing if I was you know given the opportunity to do that um so yeah I think now it's just about trying to find those positives in like a home setting so as a parent I'm aware that I do lack patience so it's about making that work for us and I think now that my daughter is much older it's shifting constantly, obviously, what she needs from me and what I need to be for her. And I think that need for patience is actually waning a bit now. Maybe it'll be back when she's a teenager and I'm like desperately yeah. clawing at the edges. But um, the impatience is something that I'm trying to rechannel into something positive and that's a struggle. What you've listed then is amazing positives and they can be with ADHD and they can be without ADHD. But I see there is a pattern I see with with women who are, I don't know, women, men, people who have got similar traits, you know, such as the curiosity and the creativity and connecting with interesting people and, you know, being able to, to talk and and that I feel very much, you know, for myself. Um, what you said about sort of the out of mind, out of sight, out of sight, out of mind. I have a few friends who are similar to me in that respect. So we can go for months without speaking and then we'll be on the phone and be like, neither one of us blames yeah. each other because, and those friendships I cherish mm-hmm. and they're the ones that I've been, I've gone through so much with because we both know that we've been busy and we've been too busy or we've not even thought about each other properly to text each other but I then you know whatsapp for me I've got it's a a bit of a double-edged sword I hate it because it overwhelms me but then it's like I can just literally leave a voice note for someone and just go I'm just thinking about you've just seen something no 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 we can catch up and and that's enough whereas maybe before social media all of that you really could just lose friendships and connections because you know it wasn't that easy to to just reconnect quickly I love speaking to other people with ADHD because there's there's so much always in common and we, there's always going to be something that we can, you know, resonate with, but also it shows up in such different ways. So it's just interesting to hear how it's, you know, for some people it shows up in one way and then not in the other way. Me and my husband always have this conversation because I was always the one with the, with the ADHD and, and the thing. 
And the more I understand ADHD, I keep saying to him, you know, I can see it. You may be more organized than I am and you may be more kind of efficient. But in other things like sitting through a school assembly, he's Mr. Twitchy and, you know, falls asleep in the cinema because it's just a sensory overload and you just fall asleep and little things like that. So it's made me realize that when we talk about spectrums and neurodivergence, it's so prevalent in so many different ways and the more we understand this you know through podcasts and people are talking more and more about it that we're not going to have this these two camps I think we're going to be able to see it in different ways and different people and I hope everyone will be more understanding more accepting and teachers in schools will be more accommodating and I mean that's my big belief is that you know when we they remove the stigmas and all the taboos and we break down, you know, we have these conversations that other people who are seemingly normal from the outside then turn around and go, well, actually, this is how my OCD shows up or this is where my anxiety shows up or this is where I simply just can't concentrate and I have to go and, you know, sit somewhere with headphones on. I try and talk about it a lot with my kids to the point where sometimes I think it's very boring for them because they just, can we just talk about something else that's not ADHD? But I want them to see how... It can just show up, Mm. you know, in friends and for them in relationships. So it's not like a big fat shock like it was for Mm. me. And that fear of judgment, that massive fear of judgment that I didn't want to talk about it to anyone. And still sometimes if I show up and I'm very vulnerable on social media, which I'm not, you know, I still have that kind of like, oh, what happens if so-and-so reads that and they think this? Um, So I hold myself back still sometimes, whereas with the podcast, I'm a lot more open because I know that the people who are interested will listen and the people who aren't interested won't listen. Mm. So I feel like I can be my very true self here. So I just, yeah, I hope that's my big hope. I don't know what what your thoughts are with that. I mean, I think the thing is that I didn't realise, and this is, I think, true of so many people who are diagnosed with something that changes the way that they might live their lives, is that the society that we live in is so ableist is massively structured around racial inequality as well but the ableism is just like all pervading and I think it's like at the moment the things that maybe that we do that aren't acceptable or the adaptations that we might require in a workplace so for example talking about part-time working or flexible hours or any of those things are still doshed out with an amount of shame and with an amount of you are having an adaptation because you can't handle the linear way that everyone else is working So I think it's about that as well. For me, I've got an amazing boss who, if I did need those adaptations, I know for a a fact that she would be like, right, this is what we're going to do, you know. And I'm really lucky in that respect. If I need to make a change, I know that that's possible. But I know far more people who aren't in that situation at all. And I think that the, the whole pandemic situation, just as it highlighted the fact that people with disabilities who struggle with a commute, who struggle with just certain office environments and things, it really highlighted that we can make those changes. We can all work from home. We can, you know, there's the technology there to support all different ways of working. And I think what was sort of sad about a lot of companies then going back on that and being like, everyone has to come back in, you know, you're not wearing masks, we're not doing this, we're not doing that, was... I think it was a sign of we're still stuck in that kind of very ableist, very meritocratic. Is that the right word? I can't think of the right word. Basically, Sounds good. Yeah, right. <laughs> I just might have made it up. Like basically that it's all based on, you know, a linear idea of success as being in the capitalist model. Mm-hmm. And that, that to me was a bit heartbreaking because I could see that there were so many benefits to the community that I find myself at now in having ADHD. A lot of the people on our podcasts are people who have like created a career around adapting just for themselves which is amazing but I'm quite mindful as well that we need to make sure that we're amplifying the voices of those who are stuck in other structures where you just you can't you just have to step up and you just have to do it even if it makes you miserable or you find yourself constantly losing work or you know it's just such a shame and I think so a big part of my feeling is like yes I want to psychoeducate the people around ADHD brains and the people who educate and care for ADHD brains but also just the wider structures that we all find ourselves in you know I follow so many people on Instagram who were finally able to live their best lives through the pandemic through being at home and feeling safe and being able to manage their own time and stuff to then being shunted straight back in without any kind of I think it feels like the world is not with you 
feels like you're on the outskirts. Um, and I think that the ADHD community, I think, has to be a part of that. And I think that we we have like a need to voice our part in that. Do you know what I mean? And our responsibility and our role to those other people that we're all kind of in it together. So I guess that's, yeah, I mean, God, that's ridiculous. I'm never going <laughs> to, it's not going to be like my thing that I'm going to achieve. It's a journey, isn't it? Again, having these conversations, which sometimes make me feel vulnerable because I think, is that going to do me out of work? Will some people not want to work with me because they'll think, oh my gosh, she, you know, she won't be able to handle it. She'll have a meltdown or burnout or whatever. And it's like you were saying, it's about understanding the nuances actually of a condition that yes, there will be certain areas that maybe we don't work in the same way, but there's also amazing potential there. These conversations are so important to just keep having and making sure that everybody who feels like they need something different in society will eventually have the opportunity to have that. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying is really powerful because eventually the, our generation or the generation below us who are very immersed in what you're talking about and giving people an autonomy to work in a way that works for them are going to be the leaders and they're going to be running the businesses and they're going to be the bosses and, and then hopefully there's going to be change. But unfortunately, still, we, we are led by middle-aged white men who um, see it not even my generation, the generation below is, you know, snowflakes and, you know, they're all, they're all sensitive and they need so much. And, you know, back in our day, everyone just went to work and they grafted and they went home. Well, hello, you know, suicides and mental health crises and all of that. And now we're sort of understanding the nuances of, of why that was showing up. And now we bring in sort of simple accommodations that is going to help lift people and let them work and thrive in a better way. That's going to be the future. Mm. But just having a conversation like this or, you you know, you write an article or talk about it on a podcast, you know, you don't know what kind of um, trickle effect that's going to have. And um, I think we just have to keep doing what, what we do mm. in our little ways and, and hope that it leads to change in some ways. And, and I think, you know, what you're talking about is very important and don't stop doing that. You so, too, Kate. Thank, I just, yeah, I just want to thank you. Yeah, because it's been great. It's been so good to talk to you. Tell me what's next with the podcast, what's next with you, career, what, what are you thinking now that you've got this new lens of ADHD? I mean, I think I'm still processing what that means for me. And I think actually by diving in and talking to other people about their stories, it's it's not sort of given me closure. It's opened more doors and more doors and more doors. So I think um, I would like to get into a good place of working out the balance. I mean, wouldn't we all? But like, I live in hope. Um, I'm hoping a second series will be on the cards at some point. And in the meantime, I'm just, I'm still voraciously reading about it. And I think that normally my hyperfocus has dropped off by now. <laughs> so it's quite interesting. I suppose it's because it's about me and I'm quite self-involved as an ADHD. <laughs> but like, I'm still constantly consuming things. And, and I think like just looking for those connections with people. Um, so I think that's, yeah. What about you? Yeah, I mean, listen, the same, yeah. like you say, it's interesting because normally my hyperfocus would be well gone. I'd be moving on to the next, but... <laughs> The thing what's so funny and it's ironic about ADHD is that there's so many little rabbit holes to go down. So it just feeds that interest. So true. So you could go down every single rabbit hole of, you know, genetics mm. and how it shows up in you know, the cells in our body and the neuroplasticity of our brains and behavior and mood and um, everything. So we can never get bored of this subject because the more we're talking about you know the research is coming out and 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 I just think you know for me with the podcast that's you know it's what it's all about is just diving into the into the little areas so people can have that self-awareness mm. um and hopefully allow them to thrive more so they can get the support and learn tools to empower themselves you know that's really what the point is is that I think as a mum with children with definitely a few of them with ADHD my biggest you know, anything that I could do to help them feel resource resourceful and empowered mm. and resilient to be able to make choices that work for them yeah. and not to have to accommodate, you know, for other people. That's my biggest hope is that they can do that and they can do what they want and not feel held back by all the internal stuff that goes on with, with ADHD, which can be really hard work. Um, so, yeah. Hopefully, we'll see. Yeah, we'll keep we'll going. See. Hopefully, we can do this together again because this was Hell fun. Yes, that would be so lovely. Thank you so much for having me, Kate. So, that's today's episode done. Did what we talk about resonate with you? I really hope you found some takeaways that may inspire you to make some small changes that enhance your daily life. 
And if you did find this episode insightful, please do consider sharing it. Knowledge and awareness is power, especially with ADHD. You can also head over to the show's Instagram page, which is ADHD Women's Wellbeing Pod, and join the community that's waiting for you there. And if this episode really did strike a chord, please do consider leaving us a review to enable more people who need to hear these conversations find the show. Thanks so much for joining me today and see you next time.